All right, good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, like many of you, I'm in finals week and uh, just finished up my semester uh, last week. And I had a semester that kind of challenged my own assumptions uh, in a lot of positive ways. I had a very, very successful semester. And I did some new things. And, I, and I'm trying to now process like what went right. <laughs> it was a very, very good semester for me. And so a lot of what I'm going to say is kind of off the cuff, just kind of feeling out, trying to figure out what went so right about this semester. Um, but John asked me to reflect on what the virtual world has to do with teaching and learning. How, what is good teaching and learning in this virtual space? So if you look around us today, I mean, in many ways, we see people, we see buildings, and so on. But in the air all around us are all of these things as well. Uh, these things are literally in the air all around us. And we have access to them through multiple devices. And this has a certain effect. And I want to bring up a sort of a paradox right from the beginning. It starts here. These are some dinosaurs that started attacking uh, families' uh, cupboards in the, around midnight every night in Kansas City. And uh, they, would, <laughs> they would take these pictures. And actually, of course, what they're doing is they're playing a joke on their kids. And every night, they would go and arrange all their plastic dinosaurs in different ways and then take a picture and Instagram it. And pretty soon, they had this huge following. Uh, and uh, just night after night. And then this goes viral. It gets on the Today Show, and of course, then it goes really viral, and this whole thing becomes Dinovember, and thousands of people, parents all over the world, start joining in. So if you went to Twitter, you would get Dino, you just look for hashtag Dinovember, and you get these tons of pictures. And it's, it represents so much of what's great about the internet. That somebody can do something creative, and it can spread so fast and create such a, a wonderful. Uh, thing. <laughs> so they asked the originators of this, uh, Reef and Susan Tuma of Kansas City, why did you do this? And they said, well, why? Because in the age of iPads and Netflix, we don't want our kids to lose their sense of wonder and imagination. In a time when the answers to all the world's questions are a web search away, we want our kids to experience a little mystery. All it takes is some time and energy, creativity, and a few plastic dinosaurs. This is something, this word here, wonder, which is so essential to this moment. Seymour Papert saw it coming 25 years ago. He was over at MIT before this existed. And he went out and he started studying four-year-olds. He was interested in how four-year-olds learn. So he went to a preschool. And at the preschool, they found out that he was from South Africa. And they got all excited. And they said, oh, we were just discussing this. How do giraffes sleep? And he didn't know how giraffes slept, even though <laughs> he was, he's from South Africa. And he thought, I should know this. But he couldn't think of it. And then he went home that night, and this is 1990, and he had an advantage that none of those kids had, which was a wall full of books, including encyclopedias. So he starts rifling through those and trying to find the answer to how giraffes sleep, and he still couldn't find the answer. But then he mused, and this was part of a book he wrote in 1993, he mused that it wouldn't be long before these kids would actually have access to thousands of videos, thousands of pictures, of how giraffes sleep. And they would access them through simple hand gestures, which is to say, he saw all this 25 years ago. And of course, it's true. So if you pick up a phone today and you use a few hand gestures, you can pull up giraffe sleeping. You'll get 59,000 YouTube videos. Um, <laughs> if that doesn't tell you how giraffes sleep and you want something more uh, sort of scholarly, you can go pick up <laughs> this. And, uh, you can see here that the positioning of the, uh, the, the paradoxical sleep was recognized by the peculiar positioning of the head on the croup. And if you don't know what a croup is, you can go to Google Images, and you can look for giraffe sleeping, and now you know what a croup is. <laughs> and, and these things basically signify these two sides of the internet. It's amazing. It's what uh, Seymour Papert actually coined this idea that it's the knowledge machine. But he also pointed out that without a sense of wonder and curiosity, it is not the world's greatest knowledge machine. It's the world's most seductive distraction device. And that's the fundamental issue that we have today. So the, this media landscape is changing very quickly. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Yik Yak. This is one of the big uh, crazes now on campus. This is like an anonymous uh, message board. It's location-based. So I can come into Boston College here, and I can pull up Yik Yak, and I can see what all the Boston College students are talking about. Um, here's one. Do you ever go on YouTube to watch a music video, and then two hours later are watching a tutorial on how to talk to drafts? Um, <laughs> this is like perfectly signifies this moment of distraction versus knowledge possibility. So we know where these two 
knowledge machines collide, the great university and this, and this, this stuff in the air that creates this other knowledge machine, we find, unfortunately, distraction. We find students working, uh, you know, texting through class and so on. Here's another yik yak for you. College, where you pay a, a load of tuition to stare at your phone in class for a month and teach yourself <laughs> half a semester in the night. <laughs> so this, is, this sort of signifies that problem. Now, from a teaching perspective, I think we often look at technology mostly in terms of information and knowledge sharing. And so we look at this and we, and we say, look, this is just the beginning. We're headed towards ubiquitous computing, ubiquitous communication, ubiquitous information at a limited speed about everything everywhere from anywhere and all kinds of devices. That's the sort of general view of the next five to 10 years. Uh, and that means that it's now ridiculously easy to connect, organize, share, collect, collaborate, and publish with anybody to anybody in the world. And that means exams like this seem increasingly out of place. Um, I, so I'm really into this idea of, of wonder and curiosity, realizing that you know, uh, there's so much information I can deliver during a lecture. But if I can deliver inspiration, a sense of curiosity, motivation, and so on, then perhaps those students will engage in some kind of lifelong learning. But they need questions. Somehow I have to generate these, those beautiful questions that, that create that, that quest in, within them where they want to just keep going and going and asking question after question. So early on when I started teaching, um, about 10 years ago, I started paying attention to the questions my students were asking. And about midway through my first semester of teaching, I paused and listened to the questions. And the questions were things like, how many points is this worth? How long does this paper need to be? What do we need to know for this test? Like, these are terrible, right? And they're not going to inspire that kind of lifelong learning that I wanted. So then I got interested in, like, how do you move students from that framework to somewhere else? And so I started diving into the literature on student development theory. So starting with William Perry at Harvard, someone uh, in the 60s, on to Belenke and Clinchy, Women's Ways of Knowing, and so on. And uh, this is a very quick model of what they were saying. Uh, what, what's been said for the last 50 or 60 years in this, this uh, field. So basically, the idea is that students come in and they have a sort of receptive type of, of knowledge pattern where they're just looking for the answers. They tend to see the world in black and white, and there are right answers and wrong answers. And, and your job as a teacher is to deliver the answers so they can memorize them for the exam. Uh, once they get to college, they start to get frustrated with professors because they pose questions. <laughs> And they view these as posed. Like, they are not real questions. You are, are posing these, and they're annoying. Because just tell me the answers so I can answer them on the exam. Eventually, they start to realize that these are not all posed questions, that there is real controversy. In every field, there's controversy. And there's actually a frontier of knowledge, and it's, and it's messy out there. And, uh, but they still believe that you know, sooner or later, we'll figure it out. As long as we have the right theory or the right uh, bits of information, we can still get back to that world of black and white. By their junior year or so, that bubble is burst, and they realize there's true ambiguity in the world. A lot of times, this actually happens through a personal crisis, where they realize that there are no clear right or wrong answers to something in their personal life. But that extends also to our fields as well. There's always ambiguity surrounding uh, these frontiers of knowledge, and it gets very messy out in that region. What we hope happens in this space is that those students can actually learn to appreciate that ambiguity, come to be comfortable within that ambiguity, because that's where all the insight comes. That's where all the exciting stuff is happening. And that's where they can emerge then into a phase of wonder. That's where you've actually uh, kind of appreciate that ambiguity, you thrive on it, and you find it as a space to play and learn and so on. And so that's where we want to get students, ultimately. Unfortunately, what happens typically when students hit that ambiguity is they, they sort of crush back in, and they go hiding back into this world of black and white. And they often revert back to the same notions that they held uh, as they came into college. So there is a certain pattern here. And, and the type of learning that the students are doing is leading to a certain type of expertise. And the type of learning that the students are doing when they're in that black and white world is you might call it strategic learning. They're simply like trying to figure out how to get the answers so they can get the A. And that leads to routine expertise. They become very good at doing problems that have already been imposed, that there's already a script for, that they can apply the formula for, and so on. Uh, but if we can move them out past ambiguity into this phase of wonder, 
that's where we find them doing a different kind of learning, this deep learning, where they're actually playing a bit and, and understanding concepts, manipulating concepts, taking responsibility for the concepts they're using and understanding why they're using them. And once they're doing that deep learning, they develop an adaptive expertise, a capacity to actually engage in problems they had never seen before and apply things that they learned in other contexts to new contexts. Obviously, that's the kind of expertise that we need and, and that we want for our students. So then I started trying to figure out, well, what are the conditions in which students feel inspired and safe to go into this phase of wonder? And so I started looking at both my own experiences with wonder as well as those of students. I started interviewing a lot of students and came to the conclusion that there were three very broad elements. There's a lot more than this, but these are the main ones that, that are there when you're in this phase of wonder. One is the sense of a quest. You have the sense of purpose where the question, it's like there's a question, but the answer to that question is just another question, and that, and that fills you with joy. Like, it doesn't frustrate you. You're just like, great, let's keep moving on on this quest. The second piece is that you're open to making connections both with new material and with other people. Uh, instead of just trying to be right, you actually enjoy being wrong because it means that there's other possibilities and you get excited about that and you start moving around through these different connections. And the third piece is that you, feel, that you start taking chances, you feel a freedom to fail, you feel uh, okay about um, uh, being vulnerable and being out there on the edge and doing these things. So, so those are the, then the things that I took to try to implement into my classes. So, for example, in my, in my big class, I thought, well, a lot of those things, quest, uh, you know, making connections, taking chances, those are things that uh, kids naturally do when they're at play. I have three young children, and I see them playing, and I think, you know, they naturally do that at play, so what if I put these students at play on really big, serious problems? And so one of the things we did is we started creating a simulation. Um, so I teach anthropology, which is a study of all humans in all times and all places. And so, well, let's, uh, that's a big topic, I know. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> let's, uh, let's try to create a simulation where everything that you're out there learning about the interactions of humans across time could be put into a simulation, into a game, and you guys get to design the game. So we create this big Google document, and we just start hashing out ideas of how we could create a game. And then we spread out all over campus and we actually play the game. And in this version, for example, it's different every year, but in this version, we spread out all over campus. And then some people get rubber bands, some people get straws, somebody get, some people get marshmallows. And then you can trade these items and you create this global trade network, which then gets interrupted by people with guns um, who have these PVC things that can shoot marshmallows and they go out and they colonize people and so on. It's, crazy and <laughs> it seems strange, but um, if, you, if you go to my workshop, I'll, I'll show you a bit more about that. Um, the nice thing about this particular one was that the students stopped asking those silly questions like what's going to be on the test, and they actually started asking some really interesting deep questions about how the world works. This is another um, college. This is a College of Landscape Architecture, which uh, I came in to help them with a project in which we canceled classes for two days, and we sent everybody around town and they map the town not based on uh, cars, but based on people travel, walking and biking. And so we marked all the bike racks, and we, we measured cur curb lane width and traffic speeds and so on to get a sense of how comfortable it is to walk or bike on these streets. We rated each street uh, from green all the way to red. Red is not so comfortable. Green is very comfortable. And in the process, uh, developed a whole new uh, plan for the city, which has been implemented over the last five years, and, and we are now a bicycle-friendly community. So these are all things where questing, connection, and taking chances were all implemented. But my favorite one is actually this. This is a smaller class that I teach. And what I did here was just try to blow the doors off a traditional syllabus altogether. I threw it up on a wiki. I let anybody edit it. And so from the very beginning, we're setting goals together. And our goal is always to create something uh, of, of great public value of some kind. And in general, we're usually making a documentary, or this year we're making a video game, um, things like that. And you can see what happens is that the reading list actually gets so big on the main syllabus that nobody can handle it. So they start breaking it up, and students started blogging. This is all on their own. I had nothing to do with this. Um, they started blogging their own syllabi, so they're assigning themselves 
books. Here you can see a student has assigned herself four books in five weeks. Um, if I assign four books in five weeks, I get rebellion. Um, but she's <laughs> that excited. And then other students start following suit. Four books in five weeks, four books in five weeks. And in the end, we've had some great success. We've had some videos um, get a lot of pre good press, lots of views. But the best part is what happens to the students. You can see here, um, this is from 2011. We put a lot of good thoughts together today in class. It's one of the sweetest class periods I think I've ever been a part of. No teacher. Um, <laughs> she said, so, so it's crazy, right? It was actually really sweet. We had the whiteboards covered with spiderweb diagrams, lists and connections, ideas we were all posing and so on. But I love the last line here. She says, we're always being shaped, always learning. What is learning? I'm learning right now, processing, learning how to communicate my thoughts, typing speed increasing. She goes on and on here. And I, I asked her about this uh, later, and she said this was uh, like a moment for her in which she transformed from somebody who's just going for the A to somebody who's really excited about learning. So there's a shift. Parker Palmer talks about it as a shift from you know, the expert delivering the object of knowledge to the amateurs to this um, space where we all come in as knowers. Uh, we know we all are knowers. And then we engage with each other as well as the subject in a living, vibrant conversation. So then I took this one step further uh, a few years ago. And this leads me to the transformative uh, semester I had this year. And that is I started uh, having this class uh, actually held inside a continuing care nursing home at our uh, in our community. So the students actually lived inside the nursing home for the semester. Um, and it's sort of like what we're trying, you know, this is anthropology where we do field work. This is my field work site in Papua New Guinea. I wanted them to actually have this sense of what it is to sit with people radically different from you and come to love them and then try to write about them or, write, or make a documentary about them. And so this is uh, one of the students reflecting on that experience here. Like, we're living in a retirement home as, like, 20-year-olds. Like, it's not, you don't just get to walk into a different culture and experience something. You can't just go to New Guinea and do that. But uh, we've found a way to do it in a culture that's right with us. In other classes, I sit next to people that have no idea who their names are. And I just, like, like we get in awkward groups for something. And it's like, oh, what do you have for this? And it's just, I don't know. This class, it's like, it's a family. Like, we are so tight um and it's good that we live right next to each other because we're always in each other's rooms uh yeah we text about everything there's always like like someone will find something new and we'll collaborate with someone else and you get to read all these notes about people that are like experiencing something different than you are and it, it's it's super cool because it's like you can see it all coming together right before your eyes and you can see everyone like like changing because of it <laughs> <laughs> uh, and to give you a sense of what this looks like in a final project, then. I was born November the 12th, 1931. No, I was born in 1934. I was born in 1923. I was born in 24. Mother had all us children at home. Doctor came out and delivered us. We were all born at home, no hospital. I was born and raised on a farm. Uh, middle of the road, dry land farm. Dad always kept it up. That was a very innocent time of my life. So this is a 10 minute video, so I'm speeding it up and cropping stuff out. Basically they got over 100 hours of audio footage and then they went out and they actually tried to have empathy for those moments these people lived by filming them, um, going to the war, coming back, having kids, raising kids, retiring, and then ultimately having a fall that sends them into the retirement home. When you're a caregiver for a long time, it, it runs you down. He went to sleep that night and never did wake up. And he died the last part of January. He just died in his sleep, basically. And he just looked like he always did. But you can't get him back. That was hard. I really, really missed him. Boy, I missed him. He just hit me that way. He wasn't here. To live in this world. You must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal. To hold it against your bones. 
knowing that your own life depends on it. And when the time comes, to let it go. Let, let it, it go. go. So this video was very successful, um, and Kinsey and Jordan uh, just got back from Paris, showing it in Paris. But like I always tell them, it's you know the video is great, but what's really special is what's happened to them. And what's happened to them is that they found that space to quest, make connections, and take chances. They went on a great journey. And if you look at what happened to Jordan right after that project, he got on his bike and he started riding to Mexico and on into Oaxaca and into Colombia. Uh, he just got back. <laughs> uh, Kinsey uh, went off and traveled all over Europe, uh, discovered that bugs were a magnificent source of protein, and is actually opening a business now. Um, <laughs> <so> <laughs> These are like this is like a amazing engagement with the world. They've become world makers. So I started reflecting then on what are the barriers to students trying to quest, make connections, and take chances. And I st and this uh, over the last couple years, trying to reflect on this question, I started going to lunch with students and having these really deep conversations with them. When you go to lunch with me, I just invite anybody who wants to go to lunch to lunch, and I spend every day at lunch with a student. And the rule of that lunch is that there is no small talk, <laughs> that we are going to talk deep. And uh, to summarize a vast array of, of conversations, I would say that there actually are really interesting questions coming out of these students that are not just about tests and grades and so on. And the big ones are things like, who am I? What am I going to do? Am I going to make it? Um, as an example of this, uh, I met a student who had just come in from California. She came, chose Kansas State from California because it was like a blank slate to her. It was a place where she could reinvent herself. When she was eight years old, she remembers driving with her, her parents and her six-year-old brother was outdoing her in math. On that day, she decided she wasn't smart. And she, decided, and she kept that image of not being smart all the way through high school. It allowed her to be very popular. But by the time she got to college, she said, as we were sitting there at lunch, she said, I've been faking it so long, I don't know who I am. And so she's wondering who she is. There's another student who her parents split up when she was young. Her mom started messing around a lot. And uh, early in her high school career, her mom just vanished. And she was left alone at school, or left alone at home. Uh, the bills didn't get paid. She ended up homeless. And that day, she goes to school. And she'd been acting out at school, as you would imagine she would. And her English teacher pulls her outside. And she says, you know, what's going on? Why are you doing this? And she just starts crying. She says, I can't go on anymore. That English teacher took her home, and she's lived with that English teacher ever since. She graduated as valedictorian, and she's sitting in my anthropology class, and she's, a, she's an accounting major. And she's an accounting major because it's safe. And she hates accounting. <laughs> so she's wondering, what's she going to do? And then I'll just give you one more example. Like a perfect student. She's amazing. She's going to be up for like Truman scholars and everything else. Like she's going to go for the top scholarships. And she hands me a note at the end of class. And it says, I'm, I know you think I'm amazing. I do all these great things. But I need you to know that I'm running from anxiety, depression, suicide. And the harder I run, the more I feel like I'm going back into those cycles. And she was especially worried about her, the people around her. She thought, everybody around me is having so much fun. Everybody around me is like having this great life. And I'm missing it. And you, know, you look then at the student profiles, and you look at all the airbrushing that happens, all the filtering that happens, not just of the colors, but also of reality itself. Like every moment's amazing. And these students have to live in this mediated environment. That's what it is to them. To us, it's like this information space that can be this great learning space. But to them, it's a social space. And it's highly filtered. And you might have heard this, read this uh, really uh, dramatic article about uh, the suicide at, at Penn, uh, in which uh, it basically points out that we're constantly comparing our insides to their outsides. Students are always doing that, because they only see this, this amazing airbrushed beauty of, of their peers and not what's going on inside. One of the students I was having lunch with said, I feel like I always have to be happy. I have, to, I have no place to express myself when things get hard. 
because you can't say that stuff on Facebook. Um, so students are shutting off their feelings. This is from Yik Yak. I think that I might have actually turned off all, all my feels off. I don't really feel much anymore. And just to, like, to point to something that's in the water, that's like, and by the water I mean like in this there, it's, it's so immersive that nobody talks about it and yet it's always there. Most of the sex happening on college campuses looks like this. And there's now emerging evidence that, that this type of sexual activity, which is rampant, uh, is, uh, is causing people to lose a sense of connection uh, to one another and a sense of, of, of vibrancy to life. So as, as uh, Thomas de Zingotito points out, in the midst of a fabulous array of historically unprecedented and utterly mind-boggling stimuli, whatever. <laughs> and so, what I've become interested in are these little lines, not just like the passage from here to there, but the little lines, which I think of as learning worth crying about. These are the spaces where students break down and they go through a transition and they emerge as something different. And the only way to get there is like with, with this young girl who came into my office and said, I've been faking it so long, I don't know who I am anymore. That was two years ago. That was Kinsey. And I think like, the biggest issue for us is that we also use technologies that pigeonhole people, that make people, uh, that in many ways uh, make us not experience the full person. And one of those technologies, of course, is the grade. And so people, some people are very you know, complacent and happy about these things, but other people are, uh, of course, completely disenfranchised by these things. So I wanted to offer an alternative here in closing. And this is what changed me so much this semester. That is, I decided to not use any grades. So instead, I imagine my students at the bottom of this great mountain, and at the top of the mountain, I put something that's worth it. And we all agreed that it was worth it. It was something we all cared about, something we all wanted to achieve. And then I just kind of scaffolded it for them, made all these little spaces where they could land and say, okay, if we get this far, then we know we can get the next space, and so on. And you might you know, say, these are assignments and the final project, whatever you want to do. But the rule is that everybody gets up. And, and I made this rule so that other people would help each other as well. So when they didn't get all the way up, these students would get a grade that was simply not yet. And what was amazing was how quickly the other students started reaching out to help. And so we made it all to that first platform. And then they started working together and finding ways to pull each other up the mountain. And we started moving. But then things get hard, as any research project you know Things get messy and you just don't know what's going to happen next. And so we really struggled through the middle part. But that struggle was made easier by struggling together. And then we kind of hit our stride and we started racing to the finish line. And by the time we got there, not that we're even there yet, but we're nearly there, what we realize is that, that the final project is not really so final, that the real project all along has been us. And that's what's worth it. A lot of what inspired this was my son. <laughs> this is my son learning how to go down steps. <laughs> and you can see like how he just like does it with such joy. And, <laughs> and then he faces problems. This is big brother coming in and like knocks him around a little bit. But he gets right back up. Month after month, this, was, this is filmed over months, by the way. <laughs> and he finally, he does it. So I want to end then with this guy. So I teach in this class, and I often would look out and I would see this guy, David. And David always looks like this, or he looks like this. <laughs> and, and I was convinced that he hated me. And, uh, and it was so psychologically challenging to teach to this. You know, and like, this is what I would see. <laughs> like, and so, of course, I had to invite him out to lunch. And I invite him out to lunch, and I find out he has a video game addiction. That's why he sleeps. Um, he, but it's a little different than other people. He is also the president of the Kansas State University board games team. He's invented all sorts of games himself, including one which he started to describe to me, which was so complex and fantastic, which integrated multiple strands of mythology and, and just 
absolutely gorgeous mathematically. It was just beautiful. And I thought, oh my gosh, this kid is a genius, and he has like a 2.5 GPA. And, and so I had invited him onto my team, my, my class, which moves into Metal Arc, and we decided to try to create a type of video game that has never really been seen before. It's kind of a real life video game where we actually take people's apartments in this retirement community and we build them inside the game. And then we rebuild all of their precious objects uh, and their memories and then we record stories from them and you can actually walk around this space and hear their stories. You can pick up objects and hear their stories. You can see uh, videos and pictures from their life. And we even are now working on scripts where we, we've been analyzing the way they actually experience the world, and we're trying to build that into the playing mechanics so that you actually can try to experience what it is to live with Alzheimer's and try to recover your memories. Uh, David has thrown himself into this and, uh, and, and become, in many ways, the superhero. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, while the, semester's not o or the semester is over, uh, the project's not done, and I just saw David post on his Facebook. We will get to continue the project this summer. Yay. So I'll end with that. Thanks.